Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to this Yellow Version solo run featuring the one and only Lord Helix Omastar. I'm Druzy, and I'm really excited to test out this ancient Pokemon. It has some pretty interesting rock and water typing and some really good stats, so I think this one could be a really strong run. So, as Professor Oak casually catches a wild Omastar, completely unimpressed at finding this previously extinct Pokemon, let's take a quick look at Omastar's base stats. Omastar has high defense and special, and even the weaker stat categories of attack and speed are still respectable. The overall stat total comes in at a tie for 23rd overall in total base stats. The moves that Omastar learns are going to play it towards its strengths. We start with Water Gun, which will give us a way to get by Brock pretty quickly. We also get Withdraw, which could be a very powerful tool for taking advantage of the badge boost glitch. Before we get to the full move set for Omastar though, we need to defeat our rival, and I think it's pretty clear that Jolteon's going to be the toughest evolution for against Omastar, and that means we need to win the lab battle and the rival 1A battle. And this is really easy, Omastar got a couple crits, it really didn't matter, but it was able to take out Eevee in two turns. Our rock typing really prevented him from doing any damage to us though, so it's really not hard in the early game. Now that we're out of the early rival battle, let's take a look at Omastar's moveset. Overall, these moves aren't great, but thankfully, thanks to the TM Learn set, we're going to get a lot of really good options. We get Stab Surf, Ice Moves, Body Slam, and that's going to give us a great variety of moves for this run. All of this should give Omastar a shot to do very well in the run, and that started with the lab battle and will continue when we face rival 1A. Much like the lab battle, this is super easy. Our approach here is to spam water gun and our rival only ends up attacking us a single time and we're only gonna take four damage. The early game resistance to normal type moves thanks to our rock typing is very helpful here. After this fairly quick battle, we've now beaten our rival both places we needed to to guarantee he will evolve his Eevee into a Jolteon. With our early game setup complete, it's time to jump to our new title sequence, brand new for Omastar. And remember to subscribe to the channel and like this video if you're enjoying it so far. Every little bit helps and I really love bringing this content. Speaking of content, let's not waste any more time on the title sequence and jump straight into Brock. Really, there isn't too much to talk about with Brock though. We outspeed the Geodude and the four times super effective Water Gun is an easy one shot on his first rock type. Onyx does outspeed us and hits us with a weak two turn bind, but one single Water Gun is enough to take it out and that's the Boulder Badge. Water type moves always make Brock a piece of cake, but with Omastar's high special, it was even easier than normal. Of course, before we get much farther into the story here, we have to make sure to stop by the Mount Moon Pokemon Center to buy a fish. When I was younger, I seriously thought this was somehow a better Magikarp than if you caught one in the wild. I mean, it isn't, but it is something I think about every time I buy from this guy. With our fish safely in a computer as it should be, we make our way into Mount Moon and this is normally a fairly boring part of the run, but today we have to highlight the fact that we obviously take the Helix Fossil. We have to show off our loyalty to our Omanite brethren here. On the way out, you'll notice that we got poisoned in the Super Nerd fight. I didn't think anything of it, but it turns out to be a very interesting problem as we go up against Jesse and James for the first time here. Because of our relatively low speed, we got outsped by Ekans and it hits us with a wrap and normally this wouldn't be a problem because it's only doing one damage per turn, but poison means we're effectively taking three per turn. After back to back wraps, we are in trouble. Water gun does over half and thankfully a wrap missed before we could finish off the Ekans, but we only have 13 HP and a critical hit bite from Meowth is not what we want to see. Growl is okay and we're able to finish off the scratch cat, but coughing's out next. We're doing about half with our water gun, but it wasn't quite enough and we lost. We got KO'd by Jesse and James. I did not see that coming at all. Omastar had been absolutely rolling through the early game, 
but Poison and Gen 1 rat mechanics are very powerful, and unfortunately, we couldn't quite overcome it. So luckily, we had saved just before the Fossil Super Nerd, so we don't have to go back too far and we aren't repeating too much of the story, and we do get a chance to avoid getting poisoned here. We have no problems with this rematch, and we avoid poison, and it lets us take the Helix Fossil for a second time, so that's kind of fun. Will this make a difference when we go up against the tandem of Jesse and James? We're gonna find out now. Without the extra damage from poison, this battle goes so much better. Ekans is a two shot with water gun and it doesn't do too much damage to us either. Now that Meowth comes out next, it gets a couple good shots off on us with bite and it ends up taking three turns this time so we were in a damage range the first time. And this time we have a much more manageable 36 HP for coughing. This is more than enough and even though water gun is still a three shot, we easily have enough health left to finish off the coughing and send Team Rocket blasting off again. This battle is a perfect example of why I prefer using in-game time rather than real time for ranking my runs. This is a bad decision on my part where easily could have used an antidote to avoid this problem and it would lead to a faster real world time. So it doesn't seem fair to me to punish a Pokemon for my bad gameplay, which is usually pretty high on these runs as they are my first playthroughs. Now that we're in Cerulean City, we can go on and face rival number two, and I'm going for rival number two before even healing at the Pokemon Center, because I think it'll be that easy, and I really like this matchup much more than the potential Misty matchup. Spira goes down to two water guns, and Sandshrew goes down to one water gun. We level up to 16, Rat Attack comes out, it hits a weak quick attack, but our water gun ends up taking it down in two turns. Eevee's out last, and this thing can't really do too much to us. Like most of the Rivals team in the early game here, that rock typing is really helpful right now, and we're able to take the Eevee down over four turns. We are now back on track after that fiasco in Mount Moon, and we can head on north to the trainers north of town, and there is a tricky trainer here, and that's the last just outside of Bill's house. She has two Oddish who know Absorb, and even though it is weak, it's four times effective on us. Oh, and we're poisoned in this battle too. So we're gonna be using Horn Attack, and it does two thirds damage, but an Absorb at 15 damage to us is doing so much. Luckily, we finish off the Pidgey quickly, and we get a Horn Attack crit on the second Oddish to avoid any really big trouble. I am really worried about how this is gonna go with the Omanite fight because the extra stats on Omastar were very helpful here. The Omanite problem is a future Druzy problem though as we can now move on to our battle with Misty. The biggest thing that you can see here is that I've added Seismic Toss to our moveset and it is absolutely clutch here, taking out Star U pretty quickly with two turns and then Star Me does end up doing really good damage, but luckily having Seismic Toss on our moveset is enough to get the knockout and earn the Cascade Badge, but also, probably more importantly, getting us TM11 Bubble Beam. This is going to give us a really good early to mid game stab move that we can use in place of Water Gun, and it's going to give us some good coverage moving forward. After that intense battle with Misty, I'm glad we came out with the win, and now we're going to be able to move on to the SSAN and get Body Slam. This move is so powerful on those solo runs and Omastar is not going to be an exception to that. We teach it in place of Horn Attack and make our way to Rival 3. And between Bubble Beam and Body Slam, we are going to probably sweep his entire team. We probably don't need to use both here. Bubble Beam knocks out Spiro. Bubble Beam could knock out Rattata, but we go for Body Slam because what's life without a little variety? Bubble Beam on Sand Shrew, and now Eevee's out. We go for Bubble Beam. Crit probably mattered, but that's a one-shot sweep of his entire team. That was about as easy of a win as you're gonna get. We can now get the HM for cut from the captain and move on to Lieutenant Surge. Surge usually isn't a major challenge, but we are weak to his electric attacks. As long as he doesn't use Thunderbolt, which he does here and gets a crit and that's going to be a one shot on us, we should be okay. Unlike some of the other gym leaders though, Lieutenant Surge doesn't have a good AI so he attacks randomly 
And this is one of the reasons that Surge is probably such a bad gym leader in Pokemon Yellow. Using only one Pokemon and not playing to its strengths, I mean, using an X speed and resisted moves when you could easily take us out with a Thunderbolt is clearly not good battle strategy. It's clear to see why Surge never got a promotion while he was in his service. With Surge defeated, we can head towards Rock Tunnel, but we have this junior trainer with a couple of Oddish and Bellsprout who could be annoying. I'm not too worried until our Body Slam doesn't one-shot the Oddish. And then I'm very worried as the Oddish hits a Stun Spore and this battle is now looking very, very bad. Absorb is pretty weak, but again, we are four times weak to it and it hits us twice before we finish off the Oddish. The first Bellsprout is out, and this is when things get really annoying as it goes for wrap every single turn. And since it's Gen 1, wrap prevents me from attacking. This is potentially going to be a slow and painful way to lose, and it's even more frustrating because our body slam took it down to a sliver of health but didn't quite get the knockout. That is so frustrating. I'm going to use withdraw here and I'm trying to get a badge boost just to boost our attack just enough that we can finally get a KO on the one shot, if it comes to that, if we're ever able to actually attack this thing. We get absolutely awful luck that once we do avoid getting wrapped and it either misses or it goes for growth, we end up fully paralyzed. So it does take a long time, but eventually if we break through, only to get knocked out by the Oddish because it's going to outspeed with a hit with an Absorb. So that was unfortunate, but not as much as realizing I hadn't saved since we defeated Surge, so we have to battle the Lieutenant again. But like I mentioned before, he obviously skipped some important lessons and he doesn't attack with Thunderbolt again, and that gives us an easy victory. We can now get our rematch with the Junior Trainer, this time being sure to save before the battle. This battle is a very different battle and that's because the Oddish ends up hitting us with Poison Powder instead of Stun Spore. While this still could be a problem, it's much more likely that we'll get the win because we won't have turns we just don't attack. We set up a withdraw and then we knock out the Bellsprout, that crit probably didn't matter, the crit on Oddish definitely did, and then the Bellsprout we get another crit, three crits in a row. After incredibly bad RNG last battle, I guess we did get some redemption, but this went from a painful loss to an easy win. RNG can be a great friend or a horrible enemy. And as we make our way out of Rock Tunnel, you'll notice I'm showing this footage and I never do. And that's because we were paralyzed by the last Oddish in the tunnel. And then I accidentally ran into this trainer. And this super nerd is a giant pain and we are in red health very quickly. We are able to take out his slow poke with only red health remaining. But oh my goodness, I really need to start paying better attention in this run because this is very close to a boss. We head to the roof of Celadon Department Store, pick up a soda pop and a fresh water. We trade the fresh water for the TM for Ice Beam which is going to give us great coverage for the grass types and also flying types moving forward. I thought about trading a soda pop for rock slide, but I don't see it being as useful with Omastar being better suited for special attacks anyway and Ice Beam already giving the same flying type coverage. So I guess the guards are going to have to settle for a soda pop today. Next up, we're heading to the rocket hideout because the grass gym is still a scary place for an Omastar. The organized crime boss is nowhere near as scary as some plants though, as after picking up the free iron, we take on Giovanni for the first time. This is pretty straightforward. While Onyx outspeeds, it missed a rock throw, and then Bubble Beam is a one shot on both the rock snake and the rock rhino that follows. His Persian is out last, and while it is fast, it really can't hurt us, so after two turns of Ice Beam, we knock out the cat and defeat Giovanni before he can even use a guard spec. So as he patronizes us by telling us we couldn't possibly understand his plan and dreams, we dig back to Lavender Town to face off with rival number four. Much like all of our rival battles up to this point, this is pretty easy. Firo goes down to one ice beam and then Shelter comes out. We hit it with a body slam and it gets a paralysis. It survives two turns in total here as Bubble Beam takes it out and we move on to the bull picks 
Vulpix goes down easily with a Bubble Beam. And then again, Sandshrew, obviously Bubble Beam, super effective, and it's going to take that out as well. Eevee goes down to a critical hit Bubble Beam, probably mattered there, but that was pretty easy. Omastar is really too much for our rival to handle right now. With our rival out of the way, we can now grab the Poke Flute and head on down to Fuchsia and take on Koga. We've grabbed the HM for Surf in the Safari Zone ahead of this, which is a great powerful stab move for Omastar. However, we don't really stand a chance here because his Venonats outspeed us and they love to put us to sleep. Sleep is so OP in Generation 1 and that leads us to lose the battle. And we're gonna need a few more levels here. So let's head over to Sylph and see how the battle against Rival Fievel goes. We've matched up pretty well in the past, so it's worth a shot. We're gonna lead off with Surf against the Sand Slash and after getting a weak poison sting that does one damage, we get the one shot, which is a fantastic way to start this. Ninetales outspeeds, but goes for Roar, so that doesn't hurt us, and another Surf one shots. Cloyster now is a bit of a brick wall though. Surf is going to do pretty good damage. Cloyster has low special relative to its defense, which its defense is the highest in the game. So eventually we do get caught in a clamp, and that's a little bit annoying. It's doing neutral damage but we're able to finally take out the Cloyster, level up to level 38, and face Kadabra. However, Kadabra outspeeds us, and that's a bit of a problem, and then our Body Slam doesn't actually get a one-shot, allowing us to take a little bit more damage. Jolteon's out next, and a single Thundershock brings us to three health, and then a double kick finishes us off. So we come back a little bit higher level after battling some of the Rockets in Silvco. We still don't outseed Sand Slash, but it goes down easily to a Surf. Ninetales, same thing as before. Roar, followed by a Surf, which is a one-shot. We level up to level 40, which hopefully will get us above the damage rounding threshold we need to be able to one-shot that Kadabra. We are able to do pretty good damage to the Cloyster, and it's still going to be a three-shot, but it's getting closer. Maybe we'll be able to get a two-shot range if we need to level up a little bit more. Clamp is super annoying because we are outsped. We can't do anything about that if it traps us in there. But this time, Kadabra hits us with a Psybeam, and again, we don't get the one shot with Body Slam. Maybe Rock Slide would have been useful here after all. On our next attempt, we're a couple levels higher again. We've now still gonna take out the Sand Slash and the Ninetales pretty quickly, but I've decided to use the Badge Boost glitch to my advantage here against the Ninetales. It can't really do too much damage to us, so a couple of withdraws boosts our defense, but more importantly, boosts our attack. Thanks to the Badge Boost glitch, our Body Slam should now be able to do more damage to the Kadabra and hopefully make that a one-shot. Cloyster goes down, and that brings out Kadabra. Now we see the moment of truth, we get out sped, and our Body Slam does now get a one-shot. Unfortunately, we do level up, which means our badge boosts are now gone, but thanks to getting those withdraws, that double kick doesn't do too much damage, and we're able to survive long enough to take out the Jolteon. That's a nice win. Maybe if our rival would have gone for Thundershock instead of double kick twice, we might have been in trouble. But that is still fairly consistent, and I'm pretty proud of that strategy about being able to leverage withdraw to get those badge boosts to get us past our rival. He was much harder than before, but all things considered wasn't too bad, and now we make our way to Giovanni. Giovanni has added Nidorino to his team in place of Onyx, and also has added Nidoqueen, but this shouldn't be a problem for our prehistoric protagonist. Surf one shots Nidorino, then a crit surf knocks out Persian, then predictably Rhyhorn goes down to a Surf, then Giovanni uses his favorite move Guard Spec only for a Surf to knock out his Nidoqueen, and that is an easy sweep on his team. With Giovanni defeated, we can now face Sabrina too, but I'm heading back to Koga because the extra level should be really helpful in making this more likely. We're now outspeeding his Venonats and things are much easier. Each of his nets is a two hit KO, but even if we get put to sleep, we're still able to get a chance to do damage, and that is much better than where we were at before. We make it all the way to his last Venonat and before we really get put to sleep for a long time, and right there as you saw, the special drop is going to be the biggest pain heading into Venomoth. Venomoth isn't gonna do too much damage to us, but now our psychic defense is very low, and on top of that, 
Our Ice Beam was not doing enough damage. We were not in a great place there. So let's try that again. Nothing is going to change really in this strategy, except we're gonna hope that we don't get put to sleep from the third Venonat. Things start out well, we knock out the first and second Venonats, and then we move on to the third one. And this time he uses an X attack, which allows us to get the KO and move on to Venomoth. Venomoth leads off with a critical hit Psychic, and our Ice Beam does a little bit over fourth, but luckily, Koga goes for back-to-back -back X attacks before hitting another Psychic. We finish it off with Body Slam, earning our fourth badge of the run. It's not exactly how I saw that battle going, but sometimes you just need to roll with a little weirdness that comes with Gen 1. With Koga now defeated, we can either do Erika, Sabrina, or Blaine, and we're gonna head to face Erika for one reason and one reason only. I'm afraid if I don't do the Erika battle now, I'll forget to do it entirely. Plus, our extra levels and Ice Beam, I think this should be a sweep, so let's see how things go here. Tangela is going to be out first, and it quickly goes down to a single Ice Beam. Weeping Bell follows, and again, one Ice Beam is enough to finish off the plant. That brings out Gloom, and the Smelly Flower also go down to a single Ice Beam, so three attacks, three knockouts, as good as you could possibly hope for, and there is badge number five. Now we have the option of either Blaine or Sabrina, and because our type advantage over Blaine, I'm gonna head to Cinnabar Island first, plus his special boost could be helpful to tank Sabrina's psychic attacks. This strategy may be a bit obvious, but we're gonna be relying on Surf here. We don't one-shot Ninetales, and it confuses us, which is annoying, but eventually we snap out of confusion and finish it off, and then we're going to be able to move on to the Rapidash. Rapidash is going to outspeed us, and we know this, but it's only going to hit a weak takedown before our Surf is going to do enough to take it out and move on to the Arcanine. Arcanine leads off with a Reflect, which is absolutely pointless, and speaking of pointless, that Fire Blast is four times resisted and it does almost nothing to us. Another Surf takes out the Fire Dog, and that gets us our sixth Gym Badge. Omastar is really speeding through the mid game here. We can now head back to Saffron and take on Sabrina, and I think this should be pretty easy too as long as our accuracy remains intact. We do avoid the flash accuracy drop from the Abra, and then we head into Kadabra where another body slam. We know it's not gonna be a one shot from before in survival, but two hits, thanks to paralysis, is enough to take it out. Alakazim hits us with a critical hit psychic, which gets a special drop, but then it misses a Psy Wave, and we get a Paralysis with Body Slam, and that's a first try victory against Sabrina. That is our seventh Gym Badge, and another first try victory. After we complete the ceremonial tossing into the trash can of TM46, we can then make our way back to Viridian City for our third and final encounter with Giovanni. Giovanni is going to lead the battle with a guard spec. That's right, he's not messing around, he is serious this time, starting with guard spec as Dugtrio then goes down to a single surf. Persian's out next, it goes for double team, and that could be annoying as it sets up another one. It hits slash, but it's not doing much. Eventually, we hit with surf, and we take it out. Nido Queen outspeeds, and it also goes for guard spec, but a single surf takes it out. Nido King's out next, it goes for an earthquake, and it does huge damage before our Surf can knock it out. Rhydon's out last, but we outspeed, Surf is four times super effective, and once again, Omastar has gotten a first try victory over a gym leader, four in a row, and only Surge and Koga weren't first try wins, which is a pretty good accomplishment for Omastar. We now only have to defeat our rival one more time before we can take on the Elite Four. Rival Six is a little bit scary with Jolteon as the anchor to his team, but I think it's still a pretty good matchup. We're starting out with a one-shot Surf on the Sand Slash and then not teaching Hydro Pump because I love the accuracy of Surf over the extra power of Hydro Pump. We may regret that later, but that's how I'm gonna play this because we don't save between the Elite Four members and we might need that extra consistency moving forward. Ninetales is an easy, easy opponent to face and deal with. Surf takes it out and Cloyster is out and we've got a paralysis thanks to body slam so we're eventually able to finish it off. Cadaver comes out, hits us with a critical psi beam, but a critical body slam takes it out as well. Jolteon then finishes us off with an 
thunder and that's a one shot for us. We're not gonna be able to tank many thunders there. So we're gonna have to hope that he either misses or goes for something else there. I think we're still in a good place here and we're gonna come right back into it. We start with Surf on Sand Slash, which we know is a one shot and Ice Beam on Execute. And then we're gonna do the badge boost strategy on Ninetales once again, because as we saw, we didn't level up after knocking out Kadabra, which is expected. And now we can set up our badge boost on the nine tails, we should now outspeed and we should have an extra attack boost thanks to having those badge boosts that are gonna be helping us. Nine tails goes down and then we see the power of badge boosts as a surf almost takes out Cloyster. Eventually, he does use a potion while in the middle of clamping us, but we take out the Cloyster and move on to the Kadabra. We're gonna now go with body slam. Thanks to those badge boosts, we outspeed and it's a one shot. We now outspeed Jolteon as well. Surf barely allows it to hang on, but we end up tanking Thunder thanks to those badge boost glitch, which also boost our special on the defense. And then we're able to finish it off with a body slam. And now we can make our way on to the Elite Four. That wasn't pretty, but it could be an interesting preview to the champion battle. We're going to need to outspeed Jolteon if possible, or get a miss with Thunder. But I think the biggest challenge we're going to face is now in full swing as we get to Lorelei and see how Omnistar does when it arrives at the Indigo Plateau. Lorelei has water and ice types and that is going to be a giant pain because we don't really have a great way to deal with either of these. Again, maybe Rock Slide would have been a good idea. Anyway, we're going to set up all six withdrawals to get those badge boosts because Dugong is a tank. We're doing very little damage with Surf, so we're likely going to need all of those to be able to make this thing possible, and eventually we do get to take it out. Cloyster is out next, and it hits us with Clamp, and we're being outsped still, and this is not great. We're stuck in Clamp, and because of Gen 1, we cannot attack, and eventually we're going to go down, and that ends our first attempt at the League. It's not too much of a problem though. We'll come back at a higher level and we're gonna come back this time at level 60, 10 levels higher than we were before. While Body Slam is doing much better damage than it was before, we still get a speed drop from Bubble Beam and it doesn't seem like too big of a deal because the setup is still very similar. This speed drop makes it that Cloyster can outspeed us and like we saw before, Cloyster can then set up clamp after clamp after clamp and we have to hope for a miss, which we do eventually get. And you can see that we're doing big damage with our Surf, but Clamp is just doing too much damage and we eventually go down and lose again. It isn't too bad though. I think the key here is that we just need to avoid a speed drop. And if we do that, I think we stand a good chance against the rest of our team. That turned out to be much easier said than done, however, as I got speed drops on each of my next eight attempts against Lorelei before we finally got this one going here. When we did end up getting those, I got by Cloyster once or twice, but it wasn't ever working and the slow bro easily took me out. This time, we finally don't get the speed drop as I just mentioned, and we are able to take out Dugong and now we're going to be able to outspeed the Cloyster. And even though it puts us in clamp, we aren't in that endless cycle that we were before. So we're able to finally finish off the Cloyster and move on to slow bro. We're gonna go with a Surf because it's doing a lot of damage. Surf hits us for okay damage as well, but one more Surf finishes off the Slowbro. Jinx is out next and it hangs on, but it is paralyzed. So we avoid taking some damage there. And that's a little bit scary as we head into Lapras. Lapras hits us with a huge Hydro Pump, taking us to eight damage, but our second Body Slam gets a Paralysis and we're able to finish off Lorelei's team. That was such an intense battle, and it definitely has me thinking that I may be making a trip to Celadon to pick up the TM for Rock Slide in the future, and that extra boost from the super effective Stab Rock move might be all that's needed to make this a bit more consistent. It might be well worth the slight accuracy trade-off. But that's enough about Lorelei, because we have a serious trainer to phase ahead of us. We're going to need to be fully healed and have all our PP at our disposal, because this trainer is an absolute legend. His onyxes, onyx, sai, onyx, whatever the plural of onyx is, are known worldwide. He complements them with incredibly rare fighting Pokemon, so we're gonna need to be ready, fully ready, to take on his team. Oh, 
The battle's basically over already. Yeah, Bruno's an absolute joke, just like usual here. Surf just devastates his whole team, and we can now use an Aether on Surf and move on to face Agatha for the first time. I think our high special should be very helpful here, but the Mega Drain on Gengar number one is a bit scary. If we can avoid that though, I think we'll be okay. The first Gengar definitely has the potential to make this battle very difficult, but it cooperates and only gets off a Confuse Ray and a Substitute before we make it out of this battle relatively unscathed, as we then are able to one-shot the Golbat with an Ice Beam. With the Golbat now taken care of, Haunter's out next, and it's going to put us to sleep, and then confuse us. And then it hits multiple Dream Eaters before we finally wake up, and we'll be able to hit it with a couple of Surfs to knock it out. We are now down to 90 HP as the Arbok comes out. It paralyzes us with Glare before we knock it out with a single Surf. Gengar number two is out, and once again, her Gengar doesn't attack us, only going for Confuse Ray and Impossible Dream Eaters, allowing us to get the two shot with Surf for the victory. This is a classic example of why outspeeding and one-shotting Agatha's team is so important. As soon as she starts getting statuses on you, the battle gets much more difficult very quickly. We easily could have lost that one, but we didn't, so we get a chance to move on to Lance. I just hope we make it this run count, because if we don't, I'm afraid Agatha's going to be a bit of a roadblock if we need to make future attempts. We've healed up, and we've used everything we need, so with Gyarados now out, we are able to avoid a Hydro Pump on the first turn, and then we're able to take it out with two Ice Beams, as Hydro Pump doesn't do too much damage to us, and now Ice Beam on both Dragon Airs is enough to one-shot both of them. We level up to level 63 just ahead of Aerodactyl, who goes for Fly, it's not going to do too much even with the crit, and Ice Beam is enough to one-shot it. Dragonite's last, it outspeeds us though. Fortunately, it missed with Thunder, but that was scary. I was not expecting Dragonite to outspeed us there, and that 30% miss chance really came in clutch for us. And now we've made our way to the champion. I'll be honest, I'm not feeling too confident heading into this one, though. We've been escaping a number of very close calls, so I think we may have used all our RNG luck up so far. We will have to see if we can continue it here, so after a brief pause to heal and restore our power points, I've also gone ahead and taught Mimic in the place of Body Slam here. It's going to give us a little bit more flexible strategy, and I think it's going to be helpful overall. I debate using that last rare candy to give us as much boost as possible, but I decide I'm going to go for it, and let's see if we can do it without needing that extra rare candy. Will Omastar be able to make its way into the Hall of Fame and into the tier list? Let's cue the champion's battle music and find out. Our rival, of course, leads with Sandslash, and I'm gonna start by mimicking Earthquake, and while it means we're going to take some damage from Earthquake, hopefully our high defense does help us with that, and it does. So after that, one Surf is enough to take out Sandslash and bring out Alakazam. Alakazam outspeeds and hits us with a very strong Psychic, and it gets a special drop. That is not great, and that's going to be rough. We do get an Earthquake, and it does one-shot. The crit probably didn't matter there, but thanks to that special drop, our Ice Beam isn't doing much against Executor, and we get hit with Leech Seed, and that's going to do a little bit of damage to us. All the Executor will ever go for is Leech Seed, thanks to our opponent's good AI, but now Cloyster is out. And even now, you'll see that thanks to that special drop, we are not in a good place. And even though it misses Clamp, we are not going to be able to outlast this Cloister. That critical hit really helped, but once it hits a critical hit Clamp, that's enough to finish us off and end the battle. Okay, so let's take a quick recap of what we learned from that battle. First of all, we don't know if Alakazam is going to be a consistent one shot or not because we got a crit with Earthquake. We also know that a special drop from Psychic is most likely leading to a reset and game over on that attempt. Finally, if we use our rare candy at our current level, we're going to level up right after Executor, which is probably the safest Pokemon to set up against outside of the Ninetales. Though while this wasn't a successful battle and a successful attempt at the League, we did learn a good bit and we can now make a much better strategy for our second round through. 
on our next attempt against the league, I've done a bit of math here, and I figured out that if we use all our rare candies before the league, and do a little bit of planning of our experience and manipulating it with the wild Pokemon in Victory Road, we should be able to level up to level 65 during the champion battle right after the Alakazam. This gives us an opportunity to set up against either the Executor or the Ninetales, and I went back to Celadon and topped up on vitamins as well. I decided not to go for Rock Slide, but that should be really helpful, and now we've made our way back all the way through to the Lance battle, and while Agatha could still be frustrating, we ended up surviving, and those vitamins ended up paying off big dividends, and that extra level makes a huge difference against Lance, because outspeeding him is now possible, and it makes his Dragonite very unscary. With Lance out of the way, we can prep for the champion again, so cue that champion battle music, and this time, we're gonna try to mimic recover on the Alakazam, and give us more staying power later in the battle. Sand Slash is a one-shot with Surf, and we knew that, and that brings out Alakazam. Alakazam outspeeds us and hits up Psychic, which is okay for us, but then I misclick with Mimic and we learn Psybeam. Psybeam is not what we wanted there. And then Alakazam makes things worse with a special drop Psychic, as our Surf does just under half now. It follows up with a critical hit Psybeam with Confusion. What is going on? Luckily, we avoid confusion and the crit surf is a guaranteed knockout. But there is no chance we win now. I waste a turn as Leech Seed slowly saps our health and we have no chance at knocking out the Executor and even if we do, we just don't have enough power to finish this one. So we're gonna end up taking a loss. That was so awful. The entire battle literally went about as badly as could be imagined as soon as I made the misclick with Mimic. To paraphrase Mike Tyson, everyone has a plan until they misclick their planned Mimic move. After that, our strategy was shot and I just couldn't ever recover. No pun intended. One bright spot from that attempt is at least we got to confirm that my math levels were correct. Well, anyway, with that loss, we are back to the start of the league again, and as many of you have seen my videos before, no, I do not save between the Elite Four and Champion to prevent me from relying on low percentage and highly luck-based strategies. This is why I tend to go for things like Ice Beam and Surf over Blizzard and Hydro Pump, even though Blizzard is 90% accurate in Gen 1. The stronger moves aren't always out of the question, but it makes it much harder to plan out consistent strategies when a few misses can really kill an attempt and put you right back to the beginning of the league. This attempt you're seeing is the very next attempt after the misclick, so like I was saying during that one, the battles against the Elite Four are getting pretty consistent. So with them being consistent, I won't voice over every single battle here, as the strategies don't change much from now on. We do still need to figure out how to solve the puzzle that is the champion though. I had what I thought was a good strategy last time before the mistake, so maybe we go that route again. Or maybe something different? I'm not even sure what I'm doing heading into this one. So as we finish off Lance, we get a freeze on Gyarados this time, and basically that's an automatic win. There's no chance that he can knock us out here, and as we saw last time, Ice Beam sweeps the rest of his team. So we can now plan out what we're going to do against the champion. and. Let's queue up that champion battle music, and I don't know what we're gonna do here, but let's see if we can somehow come out with the W. Of course, we're gonna be starting out against Sand Slash, and Sand Slash is gonna be a one shot with Surf, which we all knew was going to happen. That's gonna bring out Alakazam, and this time it goes for Psybeam instead of Psychic. And it does good damage, but we tank it easily, mimic recover, and then we can move on to using Surf. We get hit with a Psychic and we get a Special Drop, which is not ideal, but we'll be able to hopefully tank another Psybeam, which we did, even though it did do good damage, and luckily we got a crit to finish off the Alakazam. Executor is out next, and we can now set up withdraws and set up those badge boost glitch that we are going to need later in this battle, as it continues to go for Leech Seed because of our opponent's good AI. This means that we can reliably set up recover once we start to get to low health, and we will be able to keep our, our HP high as we move on further into the battle. So, after all of our six badge boosts are set up with withdraw, we have incredibly high defense, but we also have 
boosted other stats as well. And after we use our final recovers here to get back to as close to full health as we can, we will now switch to the attack, hitting an Ice Beam, which does almost full damage to the Executor, almost a one shot, but it's not quite enough. And then I switch to Surf and finish it off. Glister's out next, and this could be dangerous with Clamp combined with our Leech Seed, but Surf is doing big damage, so as long as Clamp doesn't get a crit, we should be in a very good place. Unfortunately, the Clamp lasts for a long time before we actually get the chance to attack again, so we're at 79 HP heading into Ninetales. We're going to lead off with Recover because this Ninetales can't do too much damage to us, and Confuse Rate is about as bad as it can go for. So I decide to go for a couple recovers to be as close to full health as possible, but we do get hit with a Confuse Ray instead. Probably should have just went on the attack there. Heading into the Jolteon battle with Confusion is not ideal at all, so we're going to need to stall out a little bit here and hopefully get to the end of Confusion. Eventually, I take a little bit of a gamble after recovering and go for Surf. Even though we're still confused, we break through and take out the Ninetales to bring us to Jolteon. Thanks to all those badge boosts, we do outspeed Jolteon and we go for Surf and it takes it to red. This could be a problem. Luckily, Thunder misses. And that means we can hit one more Surf and that takes out the champion's team, earning us a place in the Hall of Fame. That was a super smooth run. Omastar dominated throughout almost the entire run with only a few minor speed bumps in the way. It wasn't the most complex run when it comes to strategy, but it was so consistent in its ability to sweep through the majority of the time. This was definitely one of the faster runs so far, and Omastar finishes the run at level 65, which is a very respectable level. In terms of game time, Omastar comes in with a very strong time of 4 hours and 17 minutes. But now that we know the time and level for Omastar, we are left with a very important question. Where does it fall on the tier list? Well, I think it's safe to say that it has to be part of the top tier with the likes of Tauros, Persian, and Nidoqueen, but I don't think I would be able to put it above any of those Pokemon. So that means I'm going to be adding Omastar to the tier list in the top tier at number 6 overall. Omastar is a very strong Pokemon and I had a ton of fun with the entire run. Now that Omastar has found a place on the ever-growing list, we need to see who our next challenger will be. So you know what that means, we're bringing in the wheel to help us choose. The new look wheel gave us a great contender last time with Lord Helix, and this time it looks like it's going to give us Shelter? It is, it is Shelter. I'm not sure what to think about that one. I mean, it isn't a great Pokemon stat wise, but I also haven't really used it enough to know how that will turn out. It is a water Pokemon, so maybe the early game will still be pretty easy though. Tune into the next video to see how that one turns out. As always, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, like the video, and leave comments if you'd like. And also, make sure to turn on notifications so you know when the next video comes out. As always, I hope you enjoyed this video, and until next time, I'm Druzy, and I hope to see you again soon.